Hi, I'm Corey Nathan, and this is Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other. Your home for engaging conversations about the topics that matter most in our culture. If you love nuance, if you want to better understand different points of view, if you're tired of the screamers taking all the oxygen out of the room, if you'll enjoy edifying, provocative, and fun conversations among high-profile public figures and regular folks like me, you love talking politics and religion without killing each other. Thanks for spending some time with us. Enjoy today's show. All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are talking politics and religion without killing each other. So glad to be here among friends to have a place to talk politics and culture and big, important stuff without a bunch of screamers. Hashtag no screamers. Hashtag nuance. I, I'm trying to. It's not working. I was trying to be cool. I got like my kids, you know, doing the hashtag thing, but I guess it's not working anyway. <laughs> I guess we don't mind having some fun either. And by the way, if you like the show, tell a friend. Uh, it's a great way, probably the number one way or if you like what you're listening to, recommend it to family and friends. It's the number one way that we have of getting word out about what we're doing here. I'm your host, Corey Nathan, and glad to be crossing the divide with Jessica, the reporter Stone. Jess, how you doing? I am doing as well as can be expected with the scenes that are going on in Afghanistan right now. Yeah, seriously. I know that you have friends there. Uh, now we're recording on Tuesday, the 17th, and this will be released uh, Monday, this coming Monday. So this might be outdated, but I would like to give you the opportunity. Um, you have some friends in harm's way. Any updates you can share? Yeah, and I'm just getting more messages. Um, but uh, I've been in touch with uh, an old friend I've known for 12 years in uh, Afghanistan who has three small children and a wife. Uh, he spent uh, almost two decades working for various U.S. contractors and is still not uh, off the ground or accepted into the SIV program. Um, and we're uh, just doing everything we can to get him on uh, any flight possible, including safe transport to the airport. So please keep uh, him and his family in your thoughts and prayers. Absolutely. And um, I appreciate that. We'll certainly be talking a bit about what's going on in Afghanistan today with our guest. We are absolutely honored to have Craig Snyder, who is a senior fellow in the Foreign Policy Research Institute National Security Program. Craig is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and the Temple University School of Law. Craig served as legislative assistant for defense and foreign policy, and then as chief of staff to United States Senator Arlen Specter of Pennsylvania. More recently, our guest served as the president and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia and is the creator and executive producer of the nationally distributed public television series, The Whole Truth with David Eisenhower. And now Craig Snyder is running as a common sense Republican for the U.S. Senate in Pennsylvania. Craig, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? I'm very well, and thank you very much for having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Well, I'd like to start this way. You are a lifelong Republican. Did Donald Trump lose the 2020 election for president? And is Joe Biden the fairly elected president of the United States? You know, it's that's that's it's just so amazing that we live in a world where you have to ask that question. Yes, Donald Trump lost the election. Yes, Joe Biden is the legitimately elected president of the United States. And yes, it is unbelievable that I've got so far four opponents in my race for the Republican nomination for Senate in Pennsylvania who can't answer that simple question with a straightforward answer. Uh, and have to obfuscate because they are trying to stay in the good graces of Donald Trump. It's a sad time in that respect, but hopefully it's also a time where we can make a change. I, I appreciate that. And I know that is a, I hate to say that it sounds like a fast food version of a, of a question, but you know, it, it is a, as you put it in one of your announcements for the campaign, it's, a, it's disqualifying. So uh, I'm glad you answered the way you did. I appreciate folks who have uh, real conservative principles, but can speak to reality. So I, I really appreciate that. So you attended Penn and then Temple for law school. Did you grow up in the Philadelphia area? I did. I'm a native Philadelphian. I uh, grew up in a uh, sort of a working class section of the city called Northeast Philly, uh, sort of uh, Philadelphia's equivalent of Queens in New York. 
That's terrific. Yeah, you know, I was learning a little bit about your background, your upbringing, your political formation, and you're about the same age uh, and seem to share similar philosophies with one of my favorite people in the media today, Michael Smirkanish. Uh, he grew up in Bucks County. Did do you fellows know each other? Or I, I, I thought that was coincidental. Oh, no, he's from Bucks County. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah he's, he, he's from the suburbs. That's totally different. Um, I, I did not know Michael uh, growing up because. Uh, Is there uh, anything you know, working class about Bucks County? Uh, there, well, the, the, the southern part of Bucks County is kind of an extension of Philly, but. That's not necessarily fair if you if you get outside <laughs> of New Hope, if you get get outside of. Uh, I don't know. There's some great stomping grounds there, I, yeah. but it's well, not. Bucks County is a lovely, lovely place uh, where I'm hoping to get a, a, a lot of votes because there's a lot of real rational people there. Um, but uh, Michael See how and he I, did uh, that? That was that was good. Not that good? Not good? Yeah. Michael, Michael and I uh, know have known each other as adults for a long time, even though we didn't know each other as kids. Um, he's another former, uh, you know, alum of uh, of Arlen Specter. Uh, it's a pretty big network, actually, in Pennsylvania politics. OK, OK. I Because he came from a family similar to yours. Uh, you, I think you refer to your family as New Deal Democrats. Yes. And then um, in your young adult life, you came to the Reagan revolution. So I saw similarities in that in that trajectory in the from the same corner of the world, if you will. Yep. Now, at Penn, you studied philosophy and political economy. It's very specific. It seems you had a, an interest in politics. But specifically, the big ideas that that undergird political positions relatively early on. So I, I like to tell everybody that um, my uh, career, uh, with all of the various twists and turns it's taken, really kind of started for me when I was seven years old because I have a much older brother um, who went to Vietnam when I was seven, uh, and he was a hero of mine. Uh, and I, I, as a as a little kid, remember very distinctly starting to watch the news every night and try to figure out where in the world was Vietnam? Why was my brother there? Who sent him there? Who makes decisions to go to war? Who makes decisions to send people's big brothers you know, away to a place they might not come back from? And it was, um, uh, it was just sort of a, a kind of a baptism by fire for a little kid. Uh, and the interest never went away. Uh, then I got uh, into school, realized I wasn't very good at math. So there was, you know, all the honorable professions were off limits to me. Uh, <laughs> I had to do something with words instead. And so it all sort of fit, fit together. I feel some simpatico there, actually. <laughs> the, the math thing? <laughs> yeah. Part of why the COVID reporting is so excellent. <laughs> exactly. Were, were there some courses or, or some uh, trains of thought that, that really caught your attention that began to help you form uh, some of the basis for your political philosophy at that time? Well, that's a big question. So, um, so I started my, uh, my college career uh, at Yale, um, and then I transferred to Penn in my second year. But my, my very first class at Yale was a survey of political philosophy. Um, and what I remember is that, uh, you know, the first week we read Plato, and I thought, mm, Plato knows how we should run the world. And then the next week we read Aristotle and I thought, wait, Plato was totally wrong. Uh, <laughs> Aristotle knows how to run the world. And that went on through the entire survey because, you know, my, my head was being blown open by really big ideas, by the greatest thinkers uh, when it comes to, to the question of how should we organize a society uh, who've ever lived, you know, all the way up through and including when we got to Marx. Uh, and that seemed incredibly interesting at the time. So I needed to kind of take the, that step to see all the different points of view uh, that people have had uh, before I was anywhere close to synthesizing a view of my own. And then when I transferred to Penn uh, and decided to, you know, to really focus on this uh, academically, I had the great good fortune be, to take a class with a then very young professor just starting at Penn named Bill Crystal. Oh, yeah. And um, uh, Bill was only he's only a few years older than me, but he was the professor and I was the, the, the student. And uh, he really shaped me towards the work of of his parents. Yeah. And towards uh, the work of what at what at the time, you know, became called neoconservative thought. And uh, it made a deep impression. Uh, and it has stuck as a framework, really. I mean, the details obviously have grown, but it's stuck as a framework ever since. 
Yeah. It's funny. Uh, we, as you might know, we talked, we got, had the pleasure of talking to Bill a couple, a week or so ago. And uh, I was familiar with Irving Crystal's work, but my mind was been doing research and prep for the interview. His mother's, yes. first of all, a brilliant writer and a very yes. accomplished historian. I re- I'm still reading some of her papers. It's, it's, it was a, a gift to learn more about her work. Now, uh, jumping forward to earlier in your career as a legislative assistant, you helped to craft what became known as the Shelby Specter Amendment. I have lots of questions. So um, first, if you can give us a rundown of what that amendment in, involved, and then I'd love to hear a, a little bit behind the scenes of it all. Was it something akin to the scene we can picture of Thomas Jefferson going into his loft and crafting this beautiful and profound piece of literature, or was it more akin to what we see on shows like House of Cards and Veep? So first of all, it's Spectre Shelby, not Shelby Spectre. Let's oh. just clear that up. Right <laughs> okay. um, uh, the Shelby uh, people beg to differ. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. And they, and they have for 25 years. But um, beyond that, um, no, I'm certainly not going to compare anything about this to, uh, to Thomas Jefferson <laughs> in, the, in the Graph House and the Declaration of Independence. Um, but uh, sort of, you know, a brief version of the, uh, of the story is that uh, Senator Spectre was was concerned about the policy of the Clinton administration uh, to provide at what at the time was a large amount of funding to uh, the uh, the Palestinian Liberation Organization. This was before the creation of the Palestinian Authority. Uh, so the PLO was the was the, pre, the predecessor and particularly concerned that the United States should use leverage uh, of that aid uh, to get the PLO to amend its charter, its constitution, which at the time still called for the destruction of Israel, the elimination of the state of Israel. So we worked together, he and, he and I, to, to craft uh, some language that would be inserted into the Foreign Operations Appropriations Bill. And we went forward with that. Uh, and it became really a, a, a hell of a story. I, I don't know how much time you want to spend on it, but let's just put it this way. I spent from seven in the after, seven in the evening one day until four in the morning the, the following day with Mitch McConnell, wow. uh, who, who, was the, who was at the time the chairman of the uh, Foreign Operations Subcommittee uh, wrong, not chairman, ranking member, because the Democrats were in control of the Senate, ranking member of the uh, Senate Foreign Operations Appropriations Subcommittee uh, in the conference committee between the House and the Senate, uh, trying to get that provision put into law. And um, that evening, Senator Specter was ill. He had, a, he had a, a really bad flu. He had 100 and something fever, and he had to go home. Uh, and so I was left as a very young aide at the side of uh, Senator McConnell uh, to try to get this done. And at four in the morning, we were successful and we got we got it enacted into law as a part of that uh, that year's foreign operations bill. And indeed, the PLO changed their charter. Uh, it was successful. Wow. You know, one of the things that strikes me about your political philosophy and the way that you kind of came up into Republican politics, Craig, in light of what we're seeing with the American polling on uh, remaining troops in Afghanistan, in light of the support that both candidates, Biden and Trump, had for withdrawing from Afghanistan, and the reality that we're in this very internal looking period in our history is how do you run for U.S. Senate and get the elected office of the people of, of the state of Pennsylvania when you have such a deep bench and passion for foreign affairs? Well, so I don't, uh, I, I don't think that um, uh, that foreign affairs has to be or or will be, you know, the central focus of the campaign, but it's part of a larger philosophy, right? I'm trying to sell, uh, I'm trying to persuade the people of Pennsylvania, first the Republican voters uh, in the primary, and then ultimately the whole state, uh, about a, lar- a larger construct of ideas in which foreign policy is a part. Um, I'm never going to shy away from it because I think that at the end of the day, people are smart enough to understand uh, that, uh, you know, the United States doesn't have some kind of a force field around it. We are impacted in our lives by what happens in the world uh, in in, in every respect, economically and even in terms of the the natural environment and even um, in terms of, you know, our physical safety. 
So I think people understand that. They don't want to focus on it. They'd rather focus on kitchen table issues that they have to deal with every day. But I think they understand that um, the metaphor I like to use, it's not mine, it comes from a, a, an author named Robert Kagan, is that the United States is a villa in a jungle. Mm. And we have to tend to the jungle. When we don't tend to the jungle, when we don't weed and clear and, and care, uh, the jungle grows back uh, and it will overtake the villa if you do nothing for too long. Um, and I think people have an intuitive understanding of that. That's a lot of faith in, in Americans and really in the broader public. I guess I wonder as a follow what you, what you make of the rise in populism in our own country and um, what your message is to refute it. So I do actually have, have uh, faith. I'm a, I'm a preternatural uh, optimist. Um, and I think that the greatest political figures of my life in the United States, Ronald Reagan and Barack Obama, very different from one another, but they shared something in that they both were optimists. They both were uh, pitching to the American people uh, a view about hope. Uh, so I share that and I hope to have at least some small measure of, of that same degree of, of leadership capability to, to mobilize people's hopes. But you know, we are inward looking. It's our natural resting point. It's our default setting. It always has been from the beginning of the country. But we are also capable of rising to, to occasions when they are required, uh, either domestically or, or internationally. Um, when, you, when you talk about populism, for me in the United States, obviously that means Trumpism. And it's a complicated phenomenon and, and happy to discuss uh, as, as much in as much detail as you'd like what I think uh, the, the roots of, of, of that phenomenon are. But, but I guess the, the short version in, for me is, is really two things. One is an economic trajectory in which uh, Americans without college degrees have been increasingly disconnected from the rest of the economy, from, from those with college degrees, this whole century so far, I mean, really back to 2001. And uh, ultimately, those kinds of economic shifts are going to have political implications. So I think there's that economic part of it. And then the second part of it, I think, that explains the, the rise of Trumpism is a cultural reaction. There are, uh, I think, a, a very large number of Americans, even greater than the numbers that actually voted for Donald Trump, who are uncomfortable with a lot of the uh, cultural ideas and values and policies of the American left. Uh, and there was a reaction to that uh, in the form of the rise of a populist right. Now, I think that that reaction was in, in, in many ways more destructive of our society than the thing it was a reaction to. But, uh, but I understand its roots. I understand why people feel that way. And I think we have to address both sides of that coin. We have to address, address extremism on the left and we have to ex uh, address extremism on the right at the same time. One example of that, it, to tie it back to the current Israel-Palestinian conflict is there are folks domestically who see it through a uniquely uh, contemporary American lens. So for example, you know, you have some, some would have us believe it's a conflict between uh, Western imperialists, cruelly dominating and oppressed people. Uh, and, and I've even seen the, the yeah. concept of, of, you know, the white oppressors uh, versus victimized people of color narrative introduced into it. And then there's others who paint a different picture of, of violent, amoral terrorists on the Palestinian side, bombing innocent civilian neighborhoods on the Israeli side. You have a knack in, in the papers I've read of yours for being nuanced, for looking at things on an individual human level. So do you have a, a more accurate picture of what's actually happening there in recent months? And, and what's your position? What, what would your position be if, if you were elected to the Senate with regard to a conflict like, like what's happening in Israel right now? Again, uh, you go for the big questions, uh, which, uh, which is fair enough. Look, uh, I, I, am, uh, I consider myself a Zionist. When I was a, a kid uh, and the United Nations passed the Zionism is Racism resolution, 
Uh, I was one of the, the, the Jewish kids at that time who walked around with a button that said, I am a Zionist. That was baked in early and it hasn't changed. Uh, I believe in Israel's right to exist. I believe that Israel is a, a vibrant, successful society that contributes a great deal to the world, disproportionate to its size, for sure. Having said that, the Palestinians have national rights, uh, which should have been accommodated a long time ago, in my view. Now, it takes two sides to make that happen. And on the three or four or five, depending on how you count it, occasions when the Palestinians have been offered statehood, they have turned it down. Uh, and it does, you, you can't have a negotiation with yourself. You have to have a negotiation with both parties are, are prepared to engage. So uh, the, I, I still believe that the ultimate proper solution, morally, legally, politically, uh, is a two-state solution. Uh, but I think the, the practical reality of achieving that anytime soon is very, very, very small. Mm. And therefore, the reality, uh, unfortunate reality, is that the status quo may be the best that is possible for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Yeah, it's been going on for a few thousand years. So it's, it's uh, ignorant to think that we could go in there and, and uh, you know, try to solve it in, in a day. So I, I appreciate that um, nuanced answer. Going back a bit in your own trajectory, you went from legislative assistant to a chief of staff. How did you, for, for Arlen, Senator Arlen Specter, how did you get that gig? And could you tell us what a job like that is like? Um, so there was a job in between, which okay. was, uh, I was um, the deputy uh, campaign manager for Senator Specter's uh, short-lived campaign to be the Republican nominee for president in 1996. So I, I left Senate staff for a bit, did the political job. Um, and then when I came back uh, to Senate staff, it coincided uh, pretty much with the departure within a couple of months with the departure uh, of the then uh, chief of staff, uh, a wonderful guy named Barry Caldwell, uh, who went off into the private sector. Uh, so how I got the gig is the senator called me up and said, I'm, I'm offering you the job. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and, and I said, uh, okay, uh, I know this is going to be intense, uh, both, both in good ways and bad ways, but, uh, but you know, I, I, I'm certainly going to step up and, and give it a try. As to, uh, as to what kind of job it was, you know, it was great. It was fantastic. I got to be, to, you know, quote uh, the, the, the famous quote from Hamilton, I got to be in the room where it happens. Yeah. Um, I was young. I was uh, 35 years old. And uh, it, it was uh, just a tremendous opportunity to learn, uh, to grow, uh, to observe, to really understand the process, you know, how the sausage gets made and, um, and to participate in some pretty important things. Yeah. W one of the things that defined Arlen Specter's career is, was his ability to build coalitions among people of very, uh, a wide array of positions and backgrounds and, and uh, parties. And, uh, you know, fast forward a little bit in your own career, something that struck me about your time leading the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia is the range of speakers that you were able to involve in the in the programs from uh, it was then VP Joe Biden to Senator John McCain, uh, from one Secretary of State Condi Rice to another Secretary of State John Kerry. But the one that really caught my eye was that you had uh, Steve Bannon, and uh, as well as Me Too founder, Tar Tarana Burke. <laughs> so how are you able to include such a wide array of individuals for, uh, for from such a diverse set of viewpoints? Well, um, the World of Fresh Council of Philadelphia, but actually the World of Fresh Council network around the country, which is okay. something like 100 in independently run nonprofit organizations that all have the same mission. I mean, our mission is the title of your show. The, the World Affairs Council's mission is people talking to each other, you know, without killing each other. Uh, it's about nonpartisan dialogue, civil discourse uh, in the in the fancier phrase. Um, and so, you know, my commitment from the beginning, I was the sixth president of an organization that started 70 plus years ago. And, and I was determined uh, that no matter how contentious our current political environment is, uh, that I was going to stick to to the to the principles of the organization that went back all these decades which, which meant that you know, you're a podium for 
different ideas. You're a podium for people to come, hear different points of view and make up their own mind. Um, and so I sort of figured if I didn't have board members uh, upset at me at all times, uh, I, I just wasn't doing my job, right? So we had people who obviously did not like the fact that we had uh, Steve Bannon come and, uh, and, and we had other people who didn't like that we had even somebody like John Carrick. Mm. Um, and, and my answer was as long as I'm, I'm sort of, you know, having people yell at me from both sides, then I'm doing my job. <laughs> That's, That's what journalists say too. So yeah. again, another nexus point there, Craig. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I, I wanted to fully disclose that I finished high school in Pennsylvania and I have family in Pennsylvania, including in Bucks County, which is why I felt fairly certain of the point I made. Uh, I realize you can't necessarily agree with me as a candidate for the U.S. Senate. You know, one of the things that we've always had in Pennsylvania politics is this um, push towards the center. We have the, the blue sides of the donut, the red middle, gooey middle of the, the state. I mean, this is the this is the way we kind of look at the state politically is blue edges, red center. Um, and so the people that run statewide have to appeal to all of those constituencies. You've got what, nine or 10 opponents in this primary? How are you separating yourself? Um, so if you include, the, if you include everybody who has filed a statement of candidacy, it is, it is probably that many. There are, there are, you know, sort of generally reported to be four, uh, what you would say, substantial or major candidates other than, than, than my uh, campaign. And the, 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 the simplest way to separate it is you know, the kid's game, which one of these is not like the other. Um, and, and that's me. The, the other candidates in, in this race are, are all uniformly, universally uh, followers, supporters of President Trump. They are people who want uh, the, the Trump endorsement. And they're attacking each other already, you know, almost a year out from the election, uh, from the primary election. They're, they're already going after each other over who is more loyal uh, to, to Donald Trump. So for, for the voters in the, in the Republican base in Pennsylvania who uh, want the Trump era and Trumpism to consider, uh, to continue rather, uh, they've got at least four choices. Uh, and I think they're going to divide up uh, into sort of slivers among those four choices. Um, I am the only person in the field, and, and I will be the only person in the field, that is trying to appeal to the rest of the Republicans. Uh, which I think are a plurality. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't think they're a majority. That would be dissembling to say that. But I think they are a plurality. And, and when I say the rest, I mean folks who, whether or not they voted for Trump, and they may have, are, are, are looking for a post-Trump future in the party. Uh, they think that uh, the Republican Party, they know that the Republican Party lost the White House, the House of Representatives, and the Senate, uh, under Donald Trump. They do not like, in many cases, the policies being implemented by the Democratic uh, controlled House, Senate, and White House. And they'd like to be in a, in a chance to win some offices back so that they can bring back balance uh, to our federal government. Uh, and they understand that we're not going to do that. We are not going to attract sufficient independent voters, swing voters, even conservative Democrats, uh, unless we field candidates who are not followers of Donald Trump. Uh, so I think there's a plurality of Pennsylvania Republicans who agree with that sentiment. And I'm uh, gonna be the only you know, person speaking to that point of view. Uh, I, I have to find them, identify them, mobilize them, consolidate them. That's what my campaign's about. And that's how we're gonna win this thing. Well, I think it probably will be in, in the mainline section of, of Philadelphia. That's uh, from my understanding, those are the voters who, who gave the state to Back to back to the Democrats, so that that's a likely constituency for you, I would think. Um, one of the other things I'm interested in is how your politics compared to your old boss, Arlen Specter. For can for voters that supported Arlen Specter, voted for him, whether he was a Republican or a Democrat, because he tried them all out. How do you compare? Um, are you similar to him on immigration? It sounds like you're very similar to him on foreign affairs. And is there any place where you differ? So, you know, I had, I, our inspector was a, a mentor to me in so many ways, and I have the greatest respect for him. I've, I've often referred to him as uh, the most important Pennsylvanian since um, Benjamin Franklin. 
Um, and I really think he, politically speaking, I think he, he, he earned that. Um, having said that, um, we're different in a lot of ways. On the foreign policy question, he was, uh, he was much more of a non-interventionist uh, than I am. I, I am uh, more in, in, that, in that Bill Crystal mode of believing in a, a forward posture for American power on uh, many social issues. Uh, I'm more conservative uh, than, than he was, and, and particularly in, 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 in the current context, uh, where I think there's, a, a, as I said, a kind of extreme push to the left uh, on social policy, uh, I, I would be uh, more conservative. Uh, where I think we uh, are very similar is, is on economics. We're, we, we, we were both, we are both public figures who are fundamentally capitalists, fundamentally believers in free markets and free minds, but are, are also you know, open to selected, intelligent, targeted government action when it makes sense. So what I like to say is there is a path where government can work towards uh, economic empowerment and that that path is, is, a, is a third lane between you know, uh, abandonment, which is sort of the traditional conservative Republican attitude of government just shouldn't do any of these things, versus entitlement, which is the traditional democratic approach that the government should pretty much try to do everything and just mail a lot of people a lot of checks. I think there is a, a different, I'm not gonna call it a middle ground because it's not splitting the difference, but I think there's a different approach, an empowerment approach that, that Spectre and I uh, would, uh, would share. When, when Senator Specter decided to, to become a Democrat, I disagreed with him. I told him he shouldn't do it. He called me up and he said he had decided to be the 60th vote, the decisive vote for President Obama's stimulus bill uh, because he believed that uh, if that bill didn't pass, the United States might go from deep recession into depression, that this was something that was literally essential to save our economy. Um, and he was going to be that vote. Uh, but he believed that in the politics of that moment, that by casting that vote, he probably he probably made it impossible for him to win a Republican primary, uh, and that if he was going to stay in office, he was going to become a Democrat. So, I, I said to him, you know, Senator, you're casting the right vote, and you're casting it for the right reasons, and you should be proud of that. And then after that pride, you should retire because it's not good for your legacy to, to make this party swap. I don't think it's gonna work for you politically. And sadly, I'd, I'd say this with no joy at all. Sadly, uh, I was proven correct. He was, he was not able to win that primary on the democratic side. I'd like to push back uh, on something that I've read in some of your, your essays um, and have heard you talk, refer to a little bit even here today that there is, um, and this is a prevailing sentence. It's it's certainly you're not the only person who's talking about a big push to the left in the Democratic Party. Certainly in recent primaries, we've seen many, if not most of the cent more centrist Democrats win. There was uh, a high profile one in, in Ohio in a House race, a Democratic primary House race, uh, New York City's mayor's race, uh, AOC's favorite candidate came in third uh, and elsewhere around the country. So given that, could you envision supporting in, in Pennsylvania, for example, uh, could you envision supporting a Democratic candidate like Connor Lamb over any number of the Republican candidates? I mean, obviously, you know, we're, we're uh, centrists or, or independents. You know, we, we'd love to see a common sense Republican candidate like you win the primary. But it's not just a it's a number of races and pieces of legislation that will line up similarly where you have a Connor Lamb, say, uh, like somebody like Kathy Barnett in your state or, or other pieces of legislation, a problem solvers type of Democrat opposing a, a Trump Republican. Where would you line up? Does it just depend on the candidate and depends on the piece of legislation? Uh, well, so, of course, we're not going to let that happen because I'm going to win the primary. Um, and uh, and if Connor wins uh, the Democratic primary, which he may, uh, he, and, and if he does, if he does, it will be on the same on the same theory of the case as as me. Right. In other words, he will be the one that's not like the others in that primary. And maybe there's enough uh, of a split of the vote, uh, uh, the more progressive vote. Uh, that allows him uh, to win uh, that primary. We'll see. If that happens, uh, I would look forward to, to uh, a general election campaign 
uh, against Congressman Lamb. But, you know, I'm, I'm not going to entertain the hypothetical of would I support a Democrat against uh, a, a Republican who defeats me in the primary because I'm not going to entertain the, the, uh, the concept of losing the primary. I will say on the broader question that I think the, uh, the center of gravity among, Repu- among Democratic voters, and you're seeing this in, in these primaries, uh, is, is moderate, is centrist. Uh, but it's not the center of gravity in in terms of the of the uh, the fuel of the party. The fuel is coming from the left, and I mean that uh, in dollars, and I mean that in in intellectual energy, and I mean that in in terms of of sort of raw passion. All of those factors are on the left, and so what you get is a, a president, President Biden, who was elected. In uh, in that in those primaries, precisely because he wasn't uh, from the le- the left, uh, but yet is clearly governing from the left. I mean, he's clearly instituted. If you look at policies, whether they are on economic issues or they are on social issues, I think you'd be hard pressed to find, or even on foreign policy, as we've now seen in Afghanistan. I think you'd be hard pressed to find a place in which you would say. Biden has taken a position that is fundamentally different than what, you know, AOC would do if she was sitting, if she was you know, old enough and got elected and was sitting in the White House today. I think he is governing from the progressive wing of the party, despite how he got nominated. I'm trying to unpack that and, and um, ask, well, give us an example. Sure. Um, uh, let me look at, let me look at some of the, co- uh, the cultural stuff, right? So we have the the, the, the quote, whole of government uh, commitment to anti-racism, which as you all know, anti-racism is different than the traditional American conception of equality, of colorblind equality. You have the reversal uh, of the Trump administration policy uh, towards sexual assault uh, allegations in colleges. Uh, so we've gone back to uh, what was instituted in the uh, last years of the of the uh, Obama administration, uh, where there is essentially a presumption of guilt uh, against folks who are, and they can, and then by the way, those folks can be male or female, uh, who are uh, who have an allegation made against them about sexual harassment or assault. Um, so you've got you, you've got co- cultural and social issues like that on the environment, you have not simply a, a, you know, a a desire to respond to climate change, which is real and important and needs to happen, but a a response, but what is that response? Well, the response that the Biden administration is going towards uh, is, I think, a, 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 what I would call a leftist version of that, of that policy response in which there's a sort of heavy hand of government to try to force the adoption of decarbonization, regardless of economic consequences. Um, And then on economics, I mean, $6 trillion of spending, one third of the entire economy, it's lunatic. It's just just lunatic. We can print as much money as we want. It will have no inflationary consequences. In every one of those areas, his actual governance is, as I said, I think indistinguishable from what you would have if one of the avowed progressives, including those candidates like Bernie Sanders, who call themselves democratic socialists, had been elected. And then, as I say, most recently on foreign policy, you have the adoption by President Biden of uh, what has what has been the sort of left-wing conception of American foreign policy going back all the way to Vietnam, which is that American power in the world uh, does more harm than good, and we should do nothing that isn't in our quote unquote vital national interest, which is you know a, a subjective thing that always seems to be defined in terms of leaving other people to their own devices. So uh, this is this is I think un- unarguably the most left wing uh, presidency that we've ever had, including uh, compared to including compared to FDR. And the ambition is to go even further if it were possible, which you know, it may not be because of the narrow margins in the Congress, uh, but the ambition of the administration is extremely left-wing. And I think that 
the tone of President Biden, the sort of fundamental decency of, of President Biden as a person, I think made him the better choice for our country uh, than Donald Trump. I think the Trump era had to be definitively ended and rejected. But what we've gotten as a result is this hard swing to the left uh, that I do not think is in is the best course for our country going forward. And I don't think it's the majority view of most Americans. I, I really believe that there's about 20% on the hard right, about 20% on the hard left, and about 60% who are in between and who would really like a politics where people talk and don't kill each other like your show is called. <laughs> So, I mean, you've you've obviously made some allusions to Afghanistan uh, here, Craig, and to the policy that we're seeing unfolding as we're taping the um, attempts at a Kabul airlift. At this point, we're taping on a Tuesday, uh, and we've just had the presidential announcement on Monday, which I have to admit is probably the coldest I've ever seen Joe Biden uh, in front of an audience um, and the most resolute towards something that is being uh, pretty resoundingly condemned uh, in terms of its execution, this attempt at withdrawing uh, and leaving so many people behind. What, what went wrong here? Everything uh, went wrong. Um, uh, for me, uh, I'm not gonna join the chorus of people that says he did the right thing, he just didn't do it the right way. I think he did the wrong thing. And I think he did it for, uh, for no, good reason, certainly no compelling reason, other than uh, a belief that in terms of domestic politics, uh, this was uh, expedient, uh, which I think is gonna turn out not to have been the case. But all Joe Biden needed to do to avoid the horror that we are now witnessing, a, a horror that you know first is gonna consume the 40 million people of Afghanistan, second is gonna consume the United States and everybody who lives in our country with an increased risk of uh, another 9-11 because we've given them back their best base. And then ultimately is gonna consume a greater level of risk or, or create a greater level of risk for the entire world because of what it does to the credibility of American power, the trustworthiness of American alliance guarantees, all he had to do to avoid all of this calamity, and I really don't think that's too strong a word, is to do nothing, to not change what was in place. We had a small force, 2,500 uh, troops, who had not suffered a casualty in a year and a half, um, who had not done major combat operations for six years. They were not fighting this war. They were providing support, logistics, training, maintenance, and morale. There was no reason uh, to change it. Uh, we have a greater number of troops in any number of countries around the world who also are not engaged in ongoing combat operations. So all he had to do to avoid the calamity was nothing. That's, that's my first point. My second point is having decided to do it, yes, the execution was horrible. He seemed to have this view uh, that, uh, well, you know, we'll just rip the Band-Aid off as quickly as possible. And that the uh, consequences that we're seeing now were inevitable in his opinion, uh, and obviously they were acceptable in his opinion, because if you thought they were inevitable and you did it anyway, then you must have thought they were acceptable. Um, you can't have some kind of post hoc, uh, oh, it, it's, it's worse than I thought. Um, look, the, um, the Washington Post uh, did a piece, uh, I think the day before we're, we're taping here, that talked about what Joe Biden as a very young senator in his 30s uh, did in 1975 when uh, Vietnam, South Vietnam was about to fall to the North Vietnamese. President Ford had a, uh, Republican President Ford had a Democratic Congress that was refusing to honor the treaty commitments that the United States had made, legally binding commitments that the United States had made in order to end our participation in the war in Vietnam. We made treaty commitments to the South Vietnamese that we would continue to supply them with, well, with supplies, which ranging from, you know, fuel for vehicles to bullets. And the United States Congress cut off that aid, uh, breaking our legal commitment. 
Joe Biden was one of the people who led the effort to cut yeah. off that aid to South Korea. Basically Vietnam. what we've done now. Exactly. It's exactly the same thing. Um, and then in both cases, in both cases, 50 years apart, nearly, Joe Biden blamed the same people, which were the soldiers of our allies. Um, this argument that he made in his speech, uh, I find uh, literally revolting. It literally turns my stomach uh, that, well, uh, no Americans should be there fighting because they won't fight for themselves. The Afghan military has taken 70,000 fatalities. 70,000 Afghans died during the time when 2,500 Americans died. Now, I'm not saying that they should not have, in fact, borne more of the fight, taken more of the loss. It is their country. But 70,000 compared to 2,500, they have done that. They have borne the fight. They have taken more of the loss by far. And to turn around and say now that they wouldn't fight for their country is literally disgusting. They couldn't fight for their country in the last couple of weeks because we took out the essential things they needed, which, by the way, even more than the 2,500 uh, soldiers were the 18,000 contractors who yeah. were maintaining their vehicles. We trained them to fight with our planes and our tanks and our systems. And then we took away the guys with the wrenches who were keeping them running. Yeah, and that part of the, the argument honestly really does resonate with me because um, of course, when I was a journalist in Afghanistan, uh, I guess 12 years ago now, I, I saw the wide chasm of technological capability between the kinds of equipment the US military was using and the kinds of equipment these uh, trainees were coming to. I mean, there's, there is just an art and a level of warfare that the US military and the modern, right. and modern warfare in general takes on. Um, so I'm not even sure we did them a, a favor by teaching them that level of skill. It might've been better to be working with them along the lines of, of guerrilla fighters, which is essentially what they're fighting now. The Taliban are, are guerrilla fighters. I do want to point out, though, you know, that the president, both Biden and Trump before him, were responding to American polling, which overwhelmingly has said they want to withdraw. So if you were in the U.S. Senate today, how would you be interpreting and walking that line of trying to be sensitive to your constituents and their desires? Because a lot of blood and treasure has come from the state of Pennsylvania or the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, I should say. And at the same time, there is a lot of congressional activity going on right now to help the evacuees get out of there, the, the tens of thousands of Afghan allies who've assisted us for the past 20 years. So... Let me try to break that into a couple of pieces. Um, one, of the, one of the great quotes by uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was when he said that leaders don't find consensus, they make consensus. And I believe in that. I believe that uh, if you put yourself out as a, as a public figure and you, you, you wanna be a leader, you ask to be allowed to be a leader, you have a responsibility to try to shape public opinion, not just follow it. So yes, uh, you can show a lot of polling that says that Americans have thought that we were in Afghanistan for too long, but that's because of the information that they've, they've been given and the arguments that they've had access to. We haven't had an opposition party on this issue. We've had both Trump and Biden, both Democrats and Republicans, both liberals and conservatives saying the same thing. People need to hear alternative ideas in order to decide if they agree with them. There wasn't anybody saying to them, you know, this cost is lesser than the danger if we give it up. Now, I think, unfortunately, people are going to find out. And I think you'll see public opinion polls change. People are going to say, wait a minute. Oh, my God. Al-Qaeda can now operate in the same place that it operated from when it killed more Americans on a single day than has ever happened before in the history of our country. Maybe next time it will be with a nuclear weapon. Maybe next time it will be with a biological weapon. What have we done? I think people are going to realize, but it's a little bit too little, too late. Yeah, well, we've seen this movie before, right? It's, it's Syria, it's yeah. ISIS, it's, yeah. um, and it's just a matter of, of, 
I don't know. I, I'm of the opinion and I'm not here to give my opinion, but I'm going to give it anyway. It's just a matter of months, maybe weeks till we're back in, in full force because the caliphate's ready to go. They sure are. They sure are. And they're among the most, I mean, the Taliban is among the most medieval, evil, you know, political groups in the world. We just gave them a country. Yeah. And we gave ISIS and others in the caliphate, you know, the, the, the broader yes. uh, axis of interests that are not aligned with ours, uh, right. a foothold. So uh, speaking of making consensus, there is another life and death issue, as we all very well know here domestically and around the world. Uh, in a recent paper on vaccine objectors, you quoted at length a Tim Wise article in Medium. And <laughs> while we're sharing opinions, let me just say he lost me at those people or these people, I forget how, exactly how we put it. Uh, your position isn't just more nuanced. The paper seems to work hard to understand the hows and the whys of individuals' decisions on whether to get the vaccine. But I have to say there are moments when you seem to fall not quite so hard into that same trap, but uh, equating the entire Democratic Party with the extremist views expressed by someone like Tim Wise in his commentary. So first, would you like to flesh out a little bit more what your position is when it comes to vaccines? And then a broader scale, can you address the tendency for a lot of us in this time, I think you refer to it, I've used the same term actually, a, a cold civil war to generalize and demonize folks who don't share our views. So, uh my position is that anyone who doesn't have a medical reason for not being vaccinated, and there are indeed some medical situations in which it's not appropriate, but anyone other than that should be vaccinated. That's my position. But it's also my position uh, that forced vaccination uh, or efforts to force people to, to be vaccinated are gonna be very counterproductive in a free society. They are not gonna achieve the results that you're going after. They are going to further divide. They're going to further dig in uh, the uh, the resistance of people who are not inclined to uh, to to do it. We need to give people information. It has to come from trusted and reliable sources. And when you start this name calling and um, and demonization, which the, the 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 piece that I quoted from was just you know was just one colorful example, but I, I hear it all the time. I mean, you can't go on Twitter on this issue without seeing people saying over and over again, social, it's Darwin, it's Darwin, it's Darwin, let them die, let them die, let them die. This is, these are Americans, these are fellow Americans. When we start wishing each other to die, um, we're not going to, the, the least I can say is we're not going to get anything productive done, right? We need to find a spirit of, uh, of, of common purpose, uh, even if we disagree. And if you don't believe that for some moral reason, then just believe it for a practical political reason. You are not gonna change the opinion of people who you slur and shame uh, and, you know, and call and just call names. You're just not going to, and you're also not going to change their position by trying to use the heavy hand of government to force them. It won't work. So if your goal is vaccination, try something else. All right. Well, we hit upon a, a bunch of stuff there. I think, Jess, I think you did some uh, surveys in, in Pennsylvania, uh, Craig's potential <laughs> constituency. Did. Did a little bit of homework since I know a few folks, um, <coughs> hi, mom and dad, um, <laughs> in the state of, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, so I wanted to do a little lightning round and pick up on that theme of, of COVID vaccines. Um, and wait, I do, I do want to say, this is my last chance to, to submit that. I have to say that, that the New Hope area, I did my stopping grounds when I was about 19 was Washington's uh, crossing area oh on God. both sides of the, of, of the river there. So, and some of my favorite people in the world still live there. Sorry, I, I just, so I had groovy. to, I have to say it. Shout out to my peeps in, uh, in Bucks County. I feel like the rainbow connection music needs to be in the background. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very, very artsy. It, it's totally your vibe though. I get, totally. I get it. I get yeah. it. You cross some divides between the, are the artists and the creatives and the pragmatists in our world today. So, 
Hey, but but join me, Corey, in the lightning round. Maybe pick up with this first question here um, because we have uh, we have been talking about liberty and mandates and COVID, and so there's a lot there's a lot of, of Republican and and liberal and conservative ideas being tested out in that in that space. Yeah. So where are you on mask mandates? I, I favor mask mandates as an appropriate public health measure. I mean, I think they have to be clear and consistent, which the CDC has been anything other than clear and consistent. But in general, I think people should wear masks. At a federal level or mostly given um, g- giving leeway to local officials to, to make that call? Definitely leeway to local officials. This is a really big country. The, uh, the incidence of the disease is different in different places. Uh, I think local uh, local control in this area is is especially relevant. Now, what about lockdowns, business lockdowns, or shelter in place types of um, calls like that? Well, I think that, I think it was the right thing to do in the beginning because we really did not understand anything about this this new threat. Um, I think at this point we have we have sufficient tools, both through the vaccines and through other public health measures, uh, that we that we should not return to lockdowns. Uh, now, you know, could I rule that out under all circumstances? No. I mean, what if there is a a vaccine, a truly vaccine escaping variant? You know, then we're back to square one. But but God forbid. And we're certainly not there now. Yeah. How about critical race theory? I think it's I think it's a terrible thing. Um, and I know that there are a lot of different ways that people define that and, and argue about what those words mean. But if I if I use it in the in the sort of common what I think is the commonly understood version, um, I think it's a terrible thing. Um, I, I think that. And just for clarity, what is what is your understanding of the definition of CRT, since that is often an issue? Yes. Well, in my view, it is it, it is the uh, a set of beliefs that says that uh, white people are inherently privileged. Uh, our African-American people are inherently oppressed due to a, 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 an extensive web of structural racism uh, in our society, that you show the, ex- the existence of structural racism by pointing out any disparate results in the society. So disparity in wealth, disparity in incarceration rates, disparity in anything, disparity in test scores, all disparities uh, are accounted for by structural racism. So I think those are the those are kind of the three components. You could talk about it forever, but I think those are kind of the three components. I think those views are mistaken. I think that uh, there is uh, a profound, ugly, terrible history of racism in the United States, and I think there is a profound and ugly uh, continuing uh, level of racism uh, among some Americans. But I do not think that the United States in 2021 is a structurally racist society. I do not think that disparate uh, results, disparate uh, statistics between racial groups in our country today are explained by racism primarily. I don't think the answer uh, to either our historical legacy of racism or to the racism that continues today in, in certain quarters of our society uh, to that the, the answer is to favor any group over any other group or disfavor any group over any other group. I believe, still believe, that the only way a multiracial democracy functions is by following the rule that I think was perfectly articulated by Martin Luther King in the I Have a Dream speech, and that is that we judge people by the content of their character, not by their skin color, not by any other immutable trait that they have that they can't control. That view seems to be very much aligned with one of my favorite legal um, minds of uh, the conservative legal movement, David French. However, David has collaborated with folks with whom he disagrees about the merits of critical race theory and has written uh, papers and and columns about the um, lack of merit of a lot of the legislation that is uh, attempting to ban uh, the the teaching of, of critical race theory. Where do you stand on that? Yeah, a hundred percent. We shouldn't be banning ideas of any kind. You read Marx after all. <laughs> Where is it on his bookshelf? Let's find it. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. We have to. Um, we have to be a society of free markets and free minds, or we're not America. Um, so I don't want to ban anything. I want to persuade people. 
Uh, it's what this campaign is about. It's really what my, my life's work to date before this campaign has been about in different ways. Make your case, right? Go into the marketplace of ideas, make your case, and hopefully you get a majority. If you don't, you come back and try again the next time. You had some, you had some other lightning rounds, Jess. Yeah, I did. Uh, voter ID, a very hotly contested issue in the state, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, given how the presidential election was decided. So I think you have to separate some of these things. The Pennsylvania electoral system, indeed the American electoral system, is not fundamentally broken and therefore it doesn't need any kind of radical fixes. Whether those radical fixes come from the right, which include all sorts of voter suppression measures, or they come from the left, which would involve federalizing control over our election system. We don't have a broken system. It doesn't need to be fixed by radical ideas on either side. That doesn't mean that any proposed change is inherently racist. I don't think that voter ID laws are inherently racist. I think that, it, I think it's actually a form of racism, the racism of low expectations, uh, to claim that somehow African Americans or others, Native Americans, others, are somehow unable to function when there's a requirement like voter ID applied. So I look, do I believe that voter ID is essential to stop massive fraud? No, we don't have massive fraud. But do I think that voter ID is itself a form of Jim Crow suppression? No, that's a crazy idea of the left. Yeah. Yeah, you, you opened up another can of worms, not necessarily lighting around might require a whole other episode, but uh, there were over 100 members of the House of Representatives that voted on late night on January 6th and then into January 7th to object to the counting of the electoral votes of, of Pennsylvania and yes. Arizona. And when I received a letter from our own congressman about why he did so, he wrongly stated that it was based on um, election officials in Pennsylvania that arbitrarily uh, changed rules uh, in a moment that they thought they could. And it was actually the Pennsylvania Republican led legislature yes. that that voted uh, for some of those changes in October of 2019. Yeah, yeah, way before we even knew what pandemic with the, the um, COVID-19 was so that but I'm not going to get into that. That's uh, just a pet peeve of mine. So uh, and, and then just to wrap that up, the uh, the challenge was was brought to I think it was um, Alito. Uh, at the Supreme Court level, and it was unanimously dismissed uh, be because uh, without going into great detail, it was a frivolous objection. It was the very same legislators, state legislators that were objecting to their own law. <laughs> so. Well, let me just let me just say one thing sort of, you know, sort of on the record about that, which is uh, we recently had a, a couple of counties in Pennsylvania um, that are overwhelmingly Republican voted, you know, overwhelmingly for for Trump where the Republican boards of elections have refused to turn over their ballots to this nonsensical uh, and worse than nonsensical quote unquote audit uh, that one of the state senators who would like to be governor you know, thinks this is his ticket to ride uh, has requested. So you know, at the grassroots level, this goes back to the whole premise of my campaign, at the grassroots level, there are a lot of Republicans, even in Trump country, not just in the, the blue sides of the state, uh, uh, as we were talking about earlier, but right, right in that red middle, who have had enough of this nonsense mm -hmm. and would like to go back to talking about real issues. They know who won the election, uh, and it was Joe Biden. And, you know, and we need to move forward uh, with the country. So uh, if you can give me just the opportunity to, to, to tell your listeners if they if they like what they heard or even if they didn't, they should go check out Craig Snyder for Senate dot com. I'd love to hear from from all of all of your listeners, whatever their views, uh, as I try to move forward with this campaign. Absolutely. We, we were definitely going to get to that and we'll, we'll do it again right at the, the end for a button there. Uh, Jess, any last questions before I ask my little Jedi mind trick question? <laughs> I think another concern of social conservatives in particular in the red middle is um, the issue surrounding transgender education and rights in the schools, and in particular, the impact of making sports more accessible to transgender athletes. Your take. So, um, uh, 
the the rights of transgendered uh, individuals, I think, are you know sort of it's sort of the latest incarnation of the American story of incorporating previously rejected, ignored, marginalized groups uh, into society. And that's that progress is important. It needs to con to continue. Having said that, it is not the case that everything that a trans activist has on the political agenda is necessarily in the best interest of the country or even necessarily in the best interest of the trans community. I think that the, the I think there's a growing feud between trans activists and, and traditional feminists. And one of those areas is around this question of girls sports. It is just unarguably the case, and there's there's lots of data that, that substantiates uh, that biologically uh, that men who uh, men who are biologically men who participate in women's sports uh, have a have a kind of an unfair advantage. Uh, I, we've we've spent the last forty years in this country trying to empower women's sports, girls' sports in schools, in particular. A lot of time, money, legislation has been spent, and for good reason, to end what had been historical discrimination where all the resources went into uh, boys' sports. Uh, girls should be able to have those opportunities, and they shouldn't have to face a, a, a biologically unfair competition. So I think this is one of those areas where we need to be civil. We need to talk to each other about nuance. And, and uh, what, what bothers me about this debate is that if you say what I just said, you get called transphobic, you get called uh, you know, a bigot. I am not a bigot. I, I welcome the extension of American liberty to people who are trans, but no liberty for any group is unlimited. It has to always be weighed against the rights of other people. And in this, in this area, um, this is just one of those things that has to be thought out intelligently rather than people calling each other names. All right, last question. Any questions for us? Any questions for the hosts? Uh, I, I'd like to know how you, how you came to be doing this and, 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 and how, you, how you think you are reaching people, right? I mean, I guess my question is, do you think you're only reaching people who already agree with you or are there people who are listening to try to learn something? Right, you know, that's a great question. So how we came about doing this, I, first of all, I love the podcast medium. I think it allows for, you know, we've used the word nuance more so than other platforms and mediums. And some of the best conversations I've had in my life have been around a, a fire in my back, a, a little, you know, campfire or something uh, over a whiskey or a wine. Yeah, a fire pit um, with, you know, one or two other folks that have different opinions about important things than I do, whether it be politics, religion, or other important um, areas. And I wanted to, I wanted to continue those conversations and open it up to more folks who wanted to hear and, and even participate in those conversations. Now, do I think we are persuading anyone? I learned, uh, I, I'm a trained uh, apologist, a uh, Christian apologist. I grew up very observantly Jewish, became a Christian, and because of some of the conversations I had to have as a Christian with my Jewish family or Jewish friends, I, I spent years studying uh, the art of apologetics, um, which is basically um, uh, having, uh, conversations on difficult issues, but but doing so with gentleness and respect, make a ready defense for the case for the, the faith and the hope that's within you, but with gentleness and respect. So one of the things I learned is that if someone has a point of view or a worldview that's 180 degrees different from your own, it's very, very rare that you are going to cause some monumental epiphany that's going to change them 180 degrees. But if I can bring in a little bit of seasoning uh, that will uh, affect their, their view 1%, 2%, 3%, uh, that, that's, 
That's a win, which, by the way, oftentimes makes me vulnerable to 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 uh, augmenting my own view or or adding some nuance to my own view by one or two or three percent. Right. You know, it'd be really interesting. I don't know where you're at in terms of religion or or, or theology, but it's really interesting when you hear me talk about who Jesus was. And then you hear my dad talk about who he thinks Jesus was. My dad's an Orthodox Jew. Um, so I just, if we're, if we're having that 1% effect, if we're bringing a little bit of salt and light to these conversations in the way some folks think, I think it's a huge win. Agreed. Absolutely. I also think we're kind of in the lab on that. You know, I, I, I think, you know, you made this point earlier, Craig, about how much of the, of the country is looking for um, a place to have these types of conversations, the 60% that are not at one extreme or another. And I think, um, you know, our conversations are not going to appeal to every single listener, but I think if, I think we want to provide a, um, a platform and a place where you can have co- controversial and difficult conversations civilly and respectfully and with people who can also have them that way. So we're not inviting screamers onto the, the broadcast, um, onto the podcast uh, for that reason. Yeah. Yep. Smirkanish's uh, signature song, Jokers to the Left of Me, uh, Clowns to the Left of Me, Jokers to the Right. Uh, so here we are, stuck in the middle. Yeah. Very importantly, how can we find <laughs> more information about you? If you can tell us again, uh, your positions, your campaign, where can we find you? Craig Snyder for Senate.com. Very, uh, very simple, very straightforward. Please visit. And Snyder is spelled S-N-Y-D-E-R. Correct. S-N-Y-D-E-R. Terrific. Craig, what a pleasure. It was really terrific. Yeah. I, I've been on one of, what is it called? Clubhouse? Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I've been on a clubhouse and listened to you and that, that was great. But it's really been quite a pleasure getting to know you that much better. And uh, yeah, thanks for spending the time. I thank you both. This has been a great pleasure for me. Please feel free to come back as we get closer to the primary and once you go to the general. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jess. Be well. Have a great week. Take care. You too. Thank you for joining us today. If you appreciate what you heard here, please go to iTunes or anywhere you get your podcasts. Give us a five star rating and leave a review. That really helps move us up the chart so others can find out what we're up to here. For Ronnie Nathan, I'm Corey Nathan, and we've been talking politics and religion without killing each other. We'll be back in a few days to do our little part in Tikkun Olam.